Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Join us as we seek the truth and travel the long road to justice. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi Fruit Loop. What you know? Did you know that the little finger contributes 50% of your hand strength? Really? Yeah. So the little finger along with a ring finger act as a power bottom. The thumb, index finger, and middle finger provide dexterity. I'm just glad it's not the big toe because I don't have full function of my big toe anymore. So I must provide a lot of dexterity with that middle finger. That's my strongest finger. That is not me. But. <laughs> um, so real quick before we get started, I want to make a correction. Uh, last night, I said that Adam, Cox, and Nicole were husband and wife. I ain't trying to remarry nobody. They're divorced. So I just want to correct that. Apologize. Now we know. Happened later on or something, right? I think, wasn't it? I think. I, I, yeah. And I said ex-wife, then I said wife, and then somebody was like, girl, they're divorced. So I just want to make sure we uh, correct that. Real quick, want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. You can go to twocoolt-shirtquilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. Check them out. They'll know we sent you. We really need to do a catch-up episode soon on Alec Murdoch because just to give you the, the short of it, he got more charges today along with Curtis Eddie Smith, who was the one that was there in the roadside suicide attempt insurance scam. Apparently, the two of them are drug dealers. Yep, I saw that. So they were purchasing and selling oxycodone so the plot thickens and i'm not surprised it'd probably be easier to list what they're not charged with than what they <laughs> right. are charged and we, with. we haven't even talked about uh murder charges they're digging up the housekeeper it's just hyper speed at this point but we're gonna jump back in to this blog stuff with chad real and, quick before i forget i yeah. just noticed this the other day so i have i'm not on facebook anymore like, I pop in every once in a while and, and check messages or something on Pretty Lies. But, so I have my, I created an account, and it's just Fruit Loops, all it is. And I was like, wait, I don't have any friends. So I have no friends. So if you're listening, and that's my, um, that's the only Facebook that I look at, so. Oh, uh, yeah. I never I check my friend requests. I don't. <laughs> But I don't have any friends. I hadn't accepted any friends or anything. So, yeah, out there and you want to be my friend, just send me a shoot me a request. I'll approve you. Yeah, I totally uh, don't check Facebook much. I probably have friend requests from like 10 years ago waiting. <laughs> and my inbox is another beast. But anyway, so we left off. We were talking about Chad's blog last night. If you remember, we said when he started that blog, he put a ton of posts up in one day. We're going to keep going. Now, one thing that I did read is that Lori was especially obsessed with Chad's Standing in Holy Places series, and that included The Great Gathering, The Celestial City, Rise of Zion, which we covered last night, The Keys of the Kingdom, and The Renewed Earth. So that seems to be the five-book series that got her sort of sucked into all this. So tonight we are starting back uh, same day he starts the blog. He posts this behind the scenes of Chasing Paradise. That is not on one of the list of the ones Lori was especially enamored with. So what does he say? Uh, he says Chasing Paradise is a work of fiction, but it is based on true experiences. The descriptions of the spirit world and even the actions of various spirits are based on actual accounts of those who have had near-death experiences. And I think he lists a lot of different books people have written on near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. um, he tells how he was working on Tammy's ancestral line and felt they had left someone out. They discover a woman named Rachel M Marar. I, I think it's like Mary R or Mar yeah. Mary R. Mar yeah. You know, we butchered that. <laughs> and they submitted Rachel's name for temple work. Uh, eventually, Tammy finished her endowment work and Rachel was sealed to her parents. Chad says two days later, Rachel came to visit Tammy's grandmother who didn't know they were doing Rachel's temple work. Uh, she told Tammy's grandma she was grateful for the work and now she can join her family. 
Uh, Chad explains they got a photo from a non-family member of Rachel and Tammy's grandmother confirmed this was the woman who had visited her. Yeah. So August 10th, 2015, Chad makes another blog post titled How It All Began. And there's a photo captioned my senior class photo taken soon after my cliff jumping experience. And I actually posted that picture a few days ago on our social media. So we read about this in the first episode of the series where he recounts his cliff jump from 60 feet that tore open his veil and allowed the wackadoodleness to begin is how I put it. So we, uh, October 27th, 2015, he posts on his blog about his second water accident that completely tore open his veil and let him have one foot in the spirit world. He said, I looked up and there was a monstrous wave bearing down on me. My dad was watching me from the beach and he estimated it was at least 15 feet high. I was in a precarious position on the tip of this rock outcropping. For a second, I considered trying to ride the wave in, but I would have surely been sliced apart by the jagged rocks. An audible voice shouted in my ear, get down and cling to that rock. I did as the voice commanded and grabbed a hold of a two foot wide boulder just as the wave crashed down on me. The force was incredible and it took all of my strength not to get ripped away and tossed around. Then my surroundings changed and I found myself in the proverbial tunnel of light. It wasn't a bright white light, but more like a warm yellow heat lamp. I felt I was wrapped in a warm blanket or a cocoon, and I felt extremely happy. This time, I saw two male figures standing about 10 feet above me, and they told me several things that I still don't remember. I believe one of them was my grandpa, Keith Daybell, my dad's father, who was killed in a logging accident back in 1951. I will talk more about my other interactions with him in a later post. He then goes on to say, then I returned to my body. The wave had passed and my dad and brothers were rushing towards me. Dad said, I was sure you were dead. And he says, I guess he was half right. We looked at my hands and my fingertips were all shredded from where I'd clung to the rock. I must have let go when my spirit left my body, though, because I had been tossed around and the left side of my back had large gashes. Uh, we loaded me up and took me to the hospital to get stitches. Thankfully, I didn't receive any long-lasting injuries. Except for that torn veil. Yeah. And also, there, I have a picture of him posing in his swim trunks with his back bandaged. I'll put that out on social media tonight. I forgot to do it. Yep, so he says he shows a photo of him in swim trunks, caption, a nice shot of some awesome early 1990 swim trunks, as well as my stitched up back after a trip to a San Diego hospital. Uh, there was a long-term effect from the incident, though. My personal veil had been ripped open again, and this time it didn't close nearly as much as it had after my Flaming Gorge experience. I started having deja vu experiences and other waking visions where I could see the outcomes of certain choices for my family. I also had direct intervention in my life from the other side. I had graduated from BYU with a bachelor's degree and was working at the Ogden Standard Examiner at the time. My dad was strongly encouraging me to start working on a master's degree through Utah State. It made sense if I wanted to move up in the publishing world. Uh, I went to Utah State University Extension Office in downtown Ogden and picked up an application. But as I sat down at a table to fill it out, it felt like the pen I was holding was on fire. I dropped it and I distinctly heard the words, this is the wrong direction for you. You won't need additional schooling to accomplish your life's mission. Lord have mercy. What? <laughs> the burning pen. Uh, the voice was accompanied by one of the strongest burning of the bosom moments I've ever had. I stood up and threw the application in a recycling bin. And the answer really was a shock to me because my long-term goal growing up had been to eventually earn a doctorate degree. The interesting thing is, although I was by far the most studious of my brothers, they all now have advanced degrees and I don't. But the voice was correct. If I had returned to college, none of what has happened since would have taken place. I never would have become an author or been in a position to help those other authors publish their experiences. In my next post, I will share the strange path I took to become a published author. So that ends that blog post. And so the next one is August 17th, 2015, how I met Suzanne Freeman. And that was on his blog. He says, 
in the late 1990s, I was writing my novel, Escape to Zion. I began having many dreams and visions related to my family's future. For example, one night I had a vivid dream that Tammy had taken the kids to the Spanish Fork Kmart. In the dream, I watched Tammy lead the kids across the parking lot to the store entrance. Then little Seth broke free and stumbled ahead of the others. I distinctly noted that he was wearing a particular pair of blue overalls. Then a blue Cadillac driven by a Polynesian man came speeding by and ran over Seth, killing him instantly. The dream obviously disturbed me, but I had to leave for work before Tammy woke up. So later that morning, I call her. Before I could even tell her about the dream, she said, I've got the kids ready. I'm taking them to Kmart. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah. I immediately asked what Seth was wearing, and it was the blue overalls. I told her about the dream, and we agreed I should go to the store with them. They picked me up at the cemetery, and I carried Seth into the store. Everything was exactly as I had seen it in the dream in terms of the angle of the sun and so on. We didn't see a blue Cadillac, though. I believe we altered the timeline by a few minutes when Tammy picked me up to go with them. Uh, I have no doubt it was a warning dream sent straight from heaven. Another dream I kept having at this time was that the Twin Towers were burning. In the dreams, I was always on the street below the towers. They were both on fire and people were running and screaming. I didn't know the cause. From my vantage point, it seemed like all of Manhattan was on fire. Uh, this dream had deep personal personal significance since I served my entire mission in New Jersey along the Hudson River. The Twin Towers were like a central beacon to me. I have several photos of them in the background, and we visited them when my parents picked me up after my mission. I even included what I'd seen in Escape to Zion. In the book, the main character, Emma, is in the future, and she reads an old newspaper about the Twin Towers being burned. So it kind of threw me for a loop when it actually happened a year later. Uh, he goes on to explain he meets Suzanne Freeman, who tells him of her near-death experience, and he feels led to publish her experience. And she went on to publish three books with Chad. Uh, the ending sentence is in my, tech, my next post. I will share how I became the publisher for Julie Rowe, the author of the author, uh, the author, author of A Greater Tomorrow and The Time Is Now. So we jumped to August 21st, 1977, 1977, that's the year I was born, 2017, Chad posts the blog publishing Julie Rose books. He writes, Julie Rose books, A Greater Tomorrow and The Time Is Now have been at the top of several bestseller lists for many months, and I want to share some additional insights concerning how they were written and published. During one of our first phone conversations in January 2014, I quizzed Julie about what she saw in the spirit world, and she was quite open in describing her experience. I then asked her to name the book she had read concerning near-death experiences. I expected her to list several titles, but she only mentioned a couple that had been published several years earlier. I then asked her what she had seen concerning the future, and she became hesitant to say very much. I actually took this as a good sign. If she intended to deceive me, she likely would have the whole scenario already laid out. So now we need to take a quick break for our ad. Ads. <laughs> um, so here is our two paid sponsors for this week. Gigi, what's the first one? Our first paid sponsor is Everlywell. When you know more, you can do more. What if you could use science to discover more about your body? Find out what you need for your healthier tomorrow with Everly Well. With over 30 at-home lab tests, you'll be able to choose the test that makes the most sense for you to get the answers you need, like the women's health test or food sensitivity test. Everly Well ships products straight to you with everything needed in one package. To take your at-home lab test, simply collect your sample and use the included prepaid shipping label to mail your test back to a certified lab. Your physician-reviewed results get sent to your phone or device in just days. The whole process and experience with Everly Well is so thought out. From the packaging it comes in to the simplicity of testing, Everly Well truly has the perfect process. Uh, I decided to take the food sensitivity test, and the test is truly so simple and easy to use with just one finger stick. Uh, the Everly Well experience is trustworthy, and along with over 1 million other people, I'm eager to partner with Everly Well as they support my health and wellness goals. 
And for our listeners of Pretty Lies, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash what the world. That's everlywell.com slash what the world for 20% off your next at-home lab test. Everlywell.com slash what the world. I did mine today. I'm going to upload a video showing the testing process and we'll upload when I get my results. So our second ad, what is that, Fruit Loop? Our next partner is truly what the world good. Uh, I started taking AG1 because I wanted to get on a healthy routine. Athletic Greens is an incredible partner for an overall combination of 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, supporting gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. That's a ton of stuff, guys. Yep. The founder created Athletic Greens after experiencing how hard it was to create an optimal nutritional routine on his own. That's just awesome. And it's true that it's hard to create a solid nutrition routine. Uh, Tons of people choose to take some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. Uh, The combination of 75 amazing ingredients is just one of the reasons I chose to use AG1. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. So to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash what the world. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash what the world to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, back into the blogs we go. So as we concluded the conversation, I was sure this was the tall, dark-haired woman I'd seen in a vision years earlier, but I certainly wasn't going to tell her that. As I do with any other potential author, I prayed about whether we were supposed to publish this experience. I got a strong confirmation about it, but I still proceeded with caution. I contacted Julie again and told her I needed a solid first draft before I could send her a contract. She agreed, and over the next few days, she put together an outline and a manuscript. When I received it, I was happy with the overall outline, but the manuscript was much shorter than I expected. Julie would need to expand each chapter for it to be a publishable length. We also discussed that her book would be an additional witness to what the prophets and apostles had taught, and not contradict their statements. She completely agreed. She emphasized to me that she fully supported the president of the LDS church and was a lifelong active church member. At this point, I offered her a publishing contract, and we began a process where she expanded one chapter at a time and then sent it to me. Our problem soon changed from not having enough material for a book to having more than we could ever fit into it. As she worked on the book, Julie's mind was flooded with memories of what she had been shown in the Book of Life. For example, she wrote a segment about Joseph of Egypt and his brothers after they they were reunited in Egypt. It was fascinating, but that story alone was more than 10 typeset pages, so we decided to leave it out. Sorry for those numbers at the end. Clearly a cat walked across my keyboard. (laughs) Uh, Sherlock dialing a number. Uh... When we moved into the later chapters that covered future events, Julie had the burden of reliving the horrors she had seen concerning the coming troubles and destruction. It really wore her down emotionally. Here we go. That's what explains it. But she pushed forward with it. She could have been much more graphic and detailed in her descriptions, but that wasn't the purpose of the book. I'm happy with the overall hopeful feeling the book portrays. It shows that the Lord has been there for his faithful followers throughout all generations including our own, if we follow the prophet and apostles. Yeah, so one curious dilemma was created. I'm sorry. One curious dilemma was creating the book cover because Julie had actually seen the book in her vision of the future. She tried to describe it to me, and she mentioned a field of red flowers. I'm usually the one who finds the cover images for Spring Creek books, and in this case, I searched through hundreds of images of red flowers on a couple of photo websites. I finally found one that was similar to her description, but I knew it wasn't right. I gave up and went to bed only to awake with a start in the middle of the night. A voice said, the image is there now, Chad, wake up. 
I went out to the computer, opened the photo site and typed in field of red flowers. The image was right there on the first page. Our cover designer put it together. And the next day the, we sent it to Julie who qu quickly responded. That's it. That's amazing. So Julie's second book, The Time Is Now, was written in a similar manner, including another heavenly intervention in finding the right cover image. That book focuses on the words of the prophets concerning the latter days, which additional insights from Julie on future events. She also gives advice on how to spiritually and tempor temporarily prepare or temporally prepare for what is coming. Julie is a humble, kind person who simply seeks to do the Lord's will there is so much, okay, when you say her name, I just think of her twirling those little twirly things. <laughs> there is so much more I could share concerning Julie's books, but I feel that is all I should say right now. The books have blessed many lives in helping people recognize and understand the Lord's love for each of us. If you haven't read them, they are worth your time. In my next entry, I'm going to describe the time between my first and second near-death experiences, including my mission in northern New Jersey. Let's just say the city of Newark was an interesting place to live with a slightly torn veil. I saw some frightening things, but I also saw miracles happen. Oh, boy. So August 24, 2015, Chad blogs with the title Elder Drago, Drago, and a special visitor. He says, my freshman year at BYU can be summed up in one word, boring. I'd received a full tuition scholarship and I was worried about getting bad grades and losing the scholarship. So each day I drove to school from Springville, went to my classes, studied in the library, and then went back home. I did hang out with some high school friends during my first semester, but once they started going on missions, my social life was basically non-existent. I dated a girl a couple of times who was in my communications 101 class, but we didn't really click. She was from Florida, and on our final date, she said, sorry, but you need to get out and see the world. There's more to life than Utah Valley. I bet she's like, thank God that didn't work. Um, For real. Chad said he was slightly offended. I mean, I've been to Disneyland three times with my family, and one time I'd walked about a mile into Tijuana, Mexico. Then there was the trip to the Four Corners Monument where I stood in four different states at the same time. What did she mean? I hadn't seen the world. I was about to find out. I was called to serve as a Spanish-speaking missionary in the New Jersey Morristown Mission. I entered the Missionary Training Center on July 15, 1987, and I loved it there. With my partially torn veil, I was on a spiritual high in the MTC. It was like having loads of spiritual light dumped on me throughout the day. MTC President George Durant's powerful talks always filled me with great enthusiasm. I felt closer to the Savior there than I ever had. Uh, one time during our classroom study, our teacher shared with us a poem about the Savior leaving his heavenly home to suffer the indignities of the earth life for our sakes. As a teacher read it, I could visualize the scenes of what was happening in the poem and I started sobbing in gratitude. I couldn't stop. The teacher just stared at me as if to say, get a grip, man, it's just a poem. Finally, the teacher told the rest of my district to take a break, and he left me alone in the room as I got my emotions under control. I was about to say, that was embarrassing. Yeah, no. uh, <laughs> I was embarrassed, but I was also exuberant because the Spirit had testified so strongly to me of the Savior and His mission. Uh, during the first few months of my mission, I kept my hair fairly long compared to other missionaries. Then I got transferred to Union City, where a member lived who owned a beauty salon. She always cut the missionary's hair for free, and on our next P-Day, we went to the salon. I got in the chair, and without hesitation, she took a razor and went right up the back of my head. I saw a substantial chunk of hair fall to the ground beside me. Before I knew it, I had a flat top and the sides of my head were shaved to the skin. Yeah, we've all been there. Um, that should last you for a few weeks, she said, clearly proud of her work. I mumbled my thanks and waited for my companion who was getting his hair cut by an assistant in another corner. When he finally saw me, he said, whoa, the president might not like that. I shrugged. Well, there's nothing I can do about it now. That afternoon, as we walked down the bustling streets of Little Cuba in Union City, all the kids pointed at me, shouting the same phrase, then ran away. Finally, we asked a grinning teenage boy sitting on a porch what they were saying. On the blog, he has a picture of Drago from Rocky Four, And they're saying Drago, 
They think you're Ivan Drago, you know, the Russian guy who fought Rocky. By 1987, Rocky IV had made its way to Spanish TV, and these Hispanic kids were thinking, is it Ivan or Ivan? I can't remember. I just remember Drago himself was walking the streets of New Jersey looking for a rematch. It was kind of a stretch, but these kids had only seen a two tall, pasty white guys with flat tops, Drago and me. I dealt with that nickname for much of my mission. Even though I didn't learn the Spanish language very quickly, I immediately felt accepted and loved by the Hispanic members. I come to realize something I had never known. Many of these members regularly received dreams and visions. i had been hiding my new visionary gift and hadn't really told anyone about my flame, flaming gorge experience. But these people talked about their visions openly. My companion was talking with the other family members, so I said to Raphael... I have visions too, but I don't dare tell anyone. Back in Utah, they'd think I'm crazy. Raphael looked at me in shock. The Mormons in Utah don't talk about these things. I shook my head and Raphael responded, that's a key reason I knew the church is true. The first vision, the angel Mor Moroni, John the Baptist appearing, Peter, James, and John giving the priesthood and angels at the Kirtland Temple. It's the whole foundation of the church. Oh, they'll mention them as historical events, but it's as if the members don't believe they still happen now. Raphael got kind of fired up. The veil was very thin for Joseph Smith, and it is still, and it still is for me and my family. We talk about it all the time, and our ancestors help guide us. Hey, you know, one thing I just realized, Raphael is a name that was a pseudonym for Chad in the burner phones. Just, I don't know if that yep. came from this or what, but it just like light bulb. Anyway, yep. sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Uh, during the during a Sunday dinner appointment with a Peruvian family, I sat down next to the husband, Raphael. He had shared in testimony meeting that day a vision where his great grandpa had appeared to him while he was investigating the church in Peru. The grandpa had told Raphael to get baptized and move to America. So here I am, he said. That conversation was a turning point for me. I began to consciously develop my gift and could recognize good and bad spirits as we knocked on doors. My track Tracking? tracking era, yeah. area consisted of thousands of apartment buildings along the Hudson River, and I can testify that most of them are haunted. Maybe haunted is too strong of a word. Better said, the buildings are inhabited by disembodied spirits who died and don't really know where to go next. So they hang around places they lived in. Uh, mortality so sometimes this, fam what oh, no, yeah. we'll just finish up this yep. blog entry so sometimes families would complain about supernatural disturbances and we would use the priesthood to cast out these disruptive spirits but often during a missionary lesson i would sense both angels and disembodied spirits in the room and thought hey if these spirits want to listen in what can it hurt i sometimes saw the angels talking to them afterwards I feel there were some lessons that were more effective for those spirits than for the mortals we were teaching. Then came a cherished moment in March 1988 that helped fortify me. I'm going to quote directly from my mission journal. As we walked home tonight, I had an experience that I will always treasure. As we were walking home, my companion was on my left next to the road. And for about 30 seconds as I walked along, it was as if time stopped for me because I could sense the spirit of my deceased Grandpa Keith Daybell walking along with us on my right side. I didn't actually see him with my natural eyes, but he was tangibly there and actually rubbed shoulders with me a time or two. He was killed in a logging accident in 1951 at a young age, and so I've never met him in this life, but I knew instantly who he was, and I could almost sense my happiness at my recognition. I could almost sense his happiness at my recognition of him. No actual words were passed between us, but I was given the knowledge of how proud he was of my efforts and that he'd be there for me from time to time during my mission. He then departed and I came back to my senses. Grandpa Keith is the same person I would see in the light a few years later when I had my near-death experience at La Jolla Cove. He was still watching over me then and even to this day, he is at, with me at crucial moments in my life. And then it says in my next entry, which we will do tomorrow, I will share how I came to know Hector Sosa, the author of A Change Is Coming. Uh -oh. So I wonder, Grandpa Keith's been hanging out in the cell with him. Yeah, he been in the pokey. Been in the pokey with him, sad boy. This is not how I saw things coming. 
So anyways, that we're going to finish up there. We only have a couple of more blog entries before we get back into the main timeline. And then they kind of come every now and then. He did one update in December of 2019, but really 2018 seemed to be the year he just kind of stopped, which is when he met Lori at the end of that year, if you guys remember. So yep. don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but tomorrow night we'll finish up this first batch of these, get back onto the main timeline. And in the meantime, if you don't like and subscribe on YouTube, please go do that and share the podcast especially this mega series to people who don't know the full story. It's just a good place to start to get ready for trial that's coming up in January. By the way, Rex Bird standard standard journal last night kind of put out a clickbait headline. I posted about it. It underneath the headline, it said something about a hearing in November about a possible plea deal. So in the filing that was done Friday, this is just standard pre-trial conferences are tying up loose ends right before the case goes to trial. So essentially what it means in that document is should a plea deal be reached. I don't think there will be in the article. Archibald said there was no deal, um, but we got a lot of messages. A lot of people asking, whoa, plea deal. I saw it getting shared. So just wanted to clarify, there is no plea deal on the table. I don't think the state would offer her one. So just be careful what you what you what you see and and believe because it was in fact Nate Eaton tweeted about it wanted to clear it up so just you know wanted to put that out there as well in case you saw it but didn't see our social media post so we'll see you tomorrow night hope you have a good one